So, I did a video last night where I talked about milestones. And, you know, right away, the debate then becomes one of past records versus today's records. Now, I'm going to say straight up front, Wayne Gretzky, I've, I've, I've watched hockey for almost 40 years. Wayne Gretzky was the best hockey player I've ever watched. I didn't like the Oilers. Never cheered for the Oilers. There was never a player in the history of the game who could get behind the net with the other team and make a goal happen. Always. He had the best vision. He was the smartest player. He was never the strongest. I would argue he was never really the fastest. But the magic that man could work with the puck. And even prorated. And that gets used to, like, there's more goals back then. But even if you factor in the amount of goals in the league now, he would still have scored 170 points at his at his best season, or 160 points. So, still, in a level and league all by himself. And when you look at what he did, it's unparalleled in hockey. You know, he, he scored 212 points, and I think the next highest point total was like 150 that one year. It was, uh, it, you know, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of records that he set over his career. And they won't be touched, not just because of the year he played, but because he was the greatest of all time. But there are some who want to create more offense in the game. So I'm using the Debates magazine. This is still on the, on, on the newsstands. I've seen it in Superstore, Canada here, of course. Um, and, and I still find debates here and say, you know what, that makes for an interesting video idea because it'd be interesting to hear what other people's opinions are. And it's the debate with, with how to increase goal scoring because, you know, it is, it is down and there are games that could use an extra goal or two. Not every game needs an extra goal or two. Sometimes a great game is two to one and sometimes a crappy game is six to four, but players your, your marquee players get paid by goal scoring. And they want that. So you have a fight between goaltenders who are like, we're okay with the goal scoring being down. And your goal scorers who are saying, we want scoring up. Your defensive defenseman could care less. Offensive defensemen probably want to get a few more points in there. They look at point totals put up by guys like Phil Housley, Larry Murphy, Paul Coffey, uh, Ray Bork, Brian Leach, and they say, well, we could do that. But the debate is how to do it. So the debate here is, on one page it says smaller equipment, and on the other side it says bigger nets. And Roberto Luongo was famously quoted as saying, if the NHL went with bigger nets, he would retire on the spot. And I had no, no reason to believe at the time that he wouldn't, and that other goalies would probably follow him. So let's hear the debate out. Uh, Ken Campbell is making the argument for smaller equipment. Uh, Jason Kay is making the arguments for bigger nets. Um, I've always, I wonder with this magazine too, was this a matter of guys legitimately taking a position or was the editor going, you're taking this position and you're taking this position. And if guys just sort of rolled their eyes and went, all right, I don't know how I'm going to argue this though, because in terms of, of bigger nets, it's a tough, a tough argument to make. But let's start with smaller equipment, shall we? Uh, why are we even having this debate? We could try our best not to mess with the integrity and history of the game by mandating that goalies actually wear equipment to protect them and not help them stop the puck. Or we could make nets bigger. This, as they often say, is a no-brainer. Yes, you got, you'll got. you say that guys were so small they were named Tiny Thompson and Shrimp Werders guarded the same size nets that Ben Bishop and Pekka Rene do today, and that's true. But those goalies were also staring down players who would be considered behemoths if they were anywhere near six feet tall, and players were shooting the puck with pieces of lumber that made it almost impossible to even lift the puck off the ice. So this one's a saw-off. Much of the reason why goals are so hard to come by in today's NHL is that no position has advanced as much as goaltending. Playing goal used to be reserved for the fat kid who couldn't skate. After all, they called Harry Lumley apple cheeks for nothing, or they didn't call Harry Lumley apple cheeks for nothing. The position now attracts outstanding athletes who are coached more extensively than they've ever been before. It's not uncommon for a goaltender in today's NHL to go out on the ice for practice early and face a couple hundred shots before his teammates even have their jock straps on. So why does the NHL give them an even further advantage by allowing them to wear equipment that is clearly designed to stop the puck rather than just protect them? Let's start with the stick. Why on earth does it have to be so big? 
Why should they be permitted to pad a wad of tape at the end that is roughly the size of a beach ball? Don't tell me it's so they can pick it up more easily. In fact, if you want more goals, why would you make it even more difficult for goal? Why wouldn't you make it more uh, difficult for goalies to pick up their sticks when they drop them? Why does the bottom of the shaft and the blade have to be so wide? Does having a wide stick make it any safer for a person to play the position? No. So the NHL could easily cut a couple inches off right there. I don't like that idea. I'm going to say right out, I don't like that part of it. That I, I don't. It, seeing a goalie playing with anywhere near a regular size stick would be really weird. Uh, the NHL has vowed to streamline goaltending equipment again this season, and it's getting buy-in from goalies around the league this time. That's the best alternative, as opposed to some of the other alternatives, like changing the size of the net, said Edmonton Oilers goalie Cam Talbot. It changes the game too much. As long as goaltenders are protected, that is the best way to create more goals and achieve what they want to accomplish. The NHL could take inches off virtually every piece of equipment, every dangler and every stick, and the goaltender's safety, safety would not be compromised. If you've ever been in an NHL dressing room after a practice, morning skate, or game, and seen the goaltender sit down in the stall after taking off the upper half of his equipment and pads, you'd see it for yourself. The pants goaltenders are wearing today are so big that you'd swear these guys were skating right off the ice and into clown college. So why would you mess with a game if you didn't have to? The rim in basketball has always been 10 feet off the ground. The pitcher's mound's always been 60 feet, 6 inches from home plate. And the bases have always been 90 feet apart. The American football field has always been 100 yards long. And the hockey net should always remain 6 feet by 4 feet. So there's that argument. And, and I'll say right up front, and I always say this, I always tell you which side I'm on. I'm on the smaller equipment side. Uh, mandate smaller equipment. I don't I don't know how well the enforcement would work with it, but mandate smaller equipment. Let's go with the bigger nets argument, though. Uh, what to the abolition of slavery, Christianity, the suffragette movement, the computer, Darwin's theory of evolution, airplane travel, and Facebook have in common? Oh my god, that's a horrible way to start. Anyways, uh, they were all viewed as concepts so radical or unimaginable that the mainstream rejected them. Really? Facebook? Slavery and Facebook? I would never equate the abolition of slavery to Facebook. I've never made that connection in my life. It's brave. I don't know if it's smart, but it's brave, Mr. K. It's brave. Over time, however, each became a new normal, and profound change was effected because of inventive and courageous people. But bigger nets in hockey? That's pure madness. Just like the fact the Canucks are still up 2 to nothing on the Kings with 11 to 11.40 to go. Weird. Wisecracks aside, the sentiment is understood. For some, hockey is life and change is scary. But before you continue to jerk your knee, consider carefully that you're that you're that what you're opposing and whether it is truly extreme. Uh, the what portion, increasing the four, four feet by six feet net by a couple inches in height and or width and angling the posts. Why? Despite repeated tweaks, scoring is declining and safe percentage is climbing. Nothing else is working. Uh, we'll give the NHL some credit for trying. It has changed the two-line offside rule, cracked down on obstruction, implemented a puck over the glass foul, placed restrictions on goaltending, goalie puck handling, and shrunk their equipment. But they didn't, though. Not really. Uh, the results of the changes uh, and two dollars gets you a tall coffee at Starbucks. We're back in the 5.3 goals per game dead puck era range. At the same time, save percentages since 2005 have risen from 901 to 915. Sure, the league can contemplate further reductions in goalie gear size, but the last thing it wants to do is leave itself vulnerable to more criticism and litigation by making its players less safe. See again. A goalie. Cam Talbot, who's on this page here, in the article for Smaller Equipment says, yeah, they can they can make it smaller. One of the goalies is admitting, yeah, equipment's probably there to stop the puck. So this argument is, is tough. The concussion problem is a big enough headache, and unless the league plans on strapping stoppers back to the on stripping stoppers back to the jock, we don't see further modifications being of much use anyhow. As Martin Berder said a few years ago, he became more nimble after a new leg pad size limitation was introduced. There's no going backward in regards to goalie proficiency. They aren't going to get worse. 
Studies have shown goalies are becoming increasingly unbeatable when they get clean looks. Unless a puck or play is misdirected, a shot is tipped, a rebound pounced, or an odd man situation materializes, goalies are stopping shots about 95% of the time anyways. That jarring stat is attributable to advances in technique, coaching, training, and lighter, not bigger, equipment. The more impo most important player on any team has no. The most important player on any team has his own dedicated coach, consults sports psychologists, studies film, and knows an analytics and tendencies. In addition to understanding how to make himself big, he actually is big compared to his predecessor. The six number one goalies from 47 to 48 were on average 5'10", 170 pounds, compared to 6'3", 202 pounds in 2015-16. That's 7% taller and 14% heavier, a massive difference. Other major leagues have been, been progressive in regards to extreme rule changes. Major League Baseball has mandated strike zone size reductions and lowered the pitcher's mound. The NBA created the 24-second clock and a three-point line. And there's a movement to increase the height of the net from 10 feet to 11. In the NFL, they proudly proclaim to listen to all ideas and are constantly tweaking to stimulate offense. They even have a snappy section on their website dedicated to the history of rule changes and trumpet their open trumpet their open-mindedness. If someone wants to accuse National Football League of promoting offense to make the game more exciting, the league believes it should plead guilty. It's not that the NHL is overly shy to make adjustments. There's an entire section of the guide and record book devoted to major rule changes since 1917, and I have that book. I have that guide and record book. I could read through it, but it's, it's dry reading. It covers virtually every aspect of the game except the dimension of the nets. As a colleague quipped, the guy who invented the net must be the smartest man in hockey. It's the one area left untouched as the world around it has evolved. But as we've seen with non-calls and games, perhaps by, perhaps by doing nothing, you're doing something. Perhaps something profound. If you're worried about goalies, don't. They've adapted to other changes, most notably the mask. Jacques Plante pioneered the trend in 1959 despite opposition from coach Toe Blake, who was worried Plant's vision would be impaired. Eventually, the goalie won the day, and what may be the game's most important innovation was born thanks to a visionary extremist. Um, the mask was a smart decision. But you got to be smart with what you do with goaltenders from here. Um, they are, on some teams, the highest paid player. For many teams right now, they're the most important player. And yeah, save percentages have crept up. Team defenses are better. Um, the one thing I looked at in the 80s, and you could argue, you know, fitness. The Oilers in the 80s were a pretty damn fit team. And Mario Lemieux was in fantastic condition. Paul Coffey was generally in fantastic condition until the early 90s. And players were strong as, as, as hell back in the 80s. They were working out all the time. Um, but if, if you look at the game and you look at footage from the 80s, you just watch guys just skate right around the defense. There was no looking at videotape. There was no defensive structure. It was just five guys against five guys and just skate around. It was pot hockey. And that's what led to a lot of the goals. Sure, goalies are better. But one thing that I've always thought the NHL could could try to find a way to do is, is this is tricky, you have illegal defense in football. You have ways of figuring out to, to, to not allow defense to do certain things. And you have a legal defense in basketball. And hockey needs to figure out a way to regulate the game without without wrecking it. And that's the trick. And it's by smarter men than me that would come through with this idea. But offense isn't the answer to everything. I don't think offense would fix everything in the game because I don't really think it needs to be fixed. I'm saying if you're going to fix it, have the goalies wearing the equipment they have to wear. Concussions are, I don't even know what the guy's talking about in there. Concussions. Yeah, that's the mask. So nobody's talking about ditching the mask or make the eye holes bigger. Like, you, you know, get a puck in the eye. You can't make a save if they can't see it of their left eye. Like, 
you know, I, I, nobody's mandating that or talking about mandating that. So, in terms of of offense in the game, I think the game is 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 good. I think it needs a little bit of help. There are some games that are slow, but in general, it's the system. You know, you don't have a guy skating through everybody. Again, I, I bring up Gretzky. Gretzky would skate through all five guys. And there was no defensive system to stop him. And I don't think it would have worked now either. I don't think a defensive system created by man could have stopped that man. Or Lemieux, for that record. Uh, Lemieux and Gretzky were the two greatest hockey players ever. And I think they, they revolutionized the game. And then coaching caught up. Jacques Lemaire caught up. Because Back in the 60s and early 70s, goal scoring was low too. Not as low as it is now, but it wasn't as high as it got in the 80s. And goaltenders were small and players were, were good. Um, and this guy like Phil Esposito was putting up a ton of, ton of goals. So it's all a matter of balance. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know where you would lie. How would you create offense? Do you think the league needs to create offense? And if you're just browsing through, don't forget to hit like and subscribe because those buttons are your friends. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you all again tomorrow.